Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. This is a quote. My lovely streams have been clogged up with corpses. I cannot freely pour my waters down into the shining sea because the bodies choke me. Yet you keep killing even more, annihilating everyone. Come on, leader of troops, stop now. This is too much. That's from a new translation of the ancient Greek epic, the Iliad. It is a moment in which the river god implores Achilles to stop his murderous rampage in revenge for the killing of his closest companion, Patroclus. This new translation is done by Emily Wilson, who just a few years ago translated the Iliad's companion epic poem, The Odyssey. It made her the first woman to translate Homer's epic into, an, into the English language. Emily Wilson is a professor of classical studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She joined us a few years ago to talk about the Odyssey, and I'm very happy to welcome her back to this program to talk about the Iliad. Emily Wilson, thank you so much for taking this time. Thank you for having me again. It's a great honor to talk to you. I I enjoyed our last conversation very much, and I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. It's interesting to think about the Iliad, and I think our perception of it, because we all know of the Iliad. We've all heard of the Iliad in school and, and in popular culture, but I don't think many of us actually really know the Iliad. And that, that certainly was me for most of my life. A few years ago, I did a close reading of the Iliad and listened to some lectures as I went along with it to really try to learn it. Um, and then, of course, in these past few days, I've been spending time with your book and it's made me think much more about it again. And this quote I began with, with the river god imploring Achilles to stop his rampage. Um, and, and again, Achilles, who's the hero really of the poem, uh, is reluctant and doesn't want to fight in this war. And it's not until the killing of his companion that he gets into it. But once he does get into it, he brings a scale of destruction that is almost unimaginable. And it really, really hit me when I read the quote that I read up there with the, the river god. Uh, maybe it's just the times we're living in right now but when when i think about when i did really read the iliad the one thing that actually stuck with me from them that i remember the 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 most is this rampage that achilles Mm -hmm. did because it was just it it, even i I knew though it was a poem uh, myth it was still Mm -hmm. shocking to me yes how how do you tell me how you view achilles rampage it is shocking. I mean, I think it's totally shocking within the experience of the poem. And it's shocking for several reasons. One is that we wait so long for it. I mean, there's this there are so many paradoxes about how the Iliad tells tells its story. And one is that the great action hero, the swift footed Achilles, it doesn't move his feet at all for three quarters of the poem. And he's so angry with his his fellow Greek Agamemnon. And he refuses to fight in order to enable the Trojan hero, Hector, to make massive inroads and almost set light to the whole Greek fleet. So in a way, Achilles is causing a massacre even by not doing anything. So throughout the previous part of the poem, he's causing this massacre on his own side by refusing to fight. And then once once he does come back to battle against the Trojans, as you say, when he's overwhelmed by grief and rage at the killing of Patroclus. We've seen a lot of killing in the Iliad by this point. So you might think we'll be used to it and it will just seem like, yes, yes, more killing. How can this possibly live up to the expectation that we've got at that point? And yet it's still absolutely enthralling and shocking. And it's partly because Achilles goes across every boundary that's been established in the poem up till now about the the norms of war, including he kills 12 children who are unarmed Trojan boys in the river, clogs the river with corpses, fights against the gods, fights against nature, kills suppliants who are begging for mercy, who are unarmed. I mean, all these norms that the poem has set up as ideally we don't do this even in war. Achilles goes beyond all of those things and he's constantly unsatisfied by any killing. And he also constantly repeats the fact that he knows he's going to die soon. So in a sense, he's sort of replicating his own death and the death of Patroclus on everyone else alive on the planet. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head of why why it stood out to me is because it went beyond the norms of what was even acceptable within that poem at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And when we think of Achilles, again, I, th- I think most people, again, know of the Iliad, but don't really know the Iliad. And you might think the hero of this epic myth is is some noble figure, but that 
that that's not what I came away with mm -hmm. when it came to it. I mean, I'm misled by the modern connotations of the word hero, which of course comes from the Greek heroes, but the Greek term doesn't necessarily mean morally upstanding person who wouldn't kill you. I mean, it, it suggests either a semi-divine person, and of course, Achilles is the son of a goddess. He's more, he's more than most people. He's more, he's swifter, he's better at killing than most people are. He's very talented, and he has a perspective on things which most people don't. Does that mean he's a nice guy? <laughs> no, not necessarily. It's not really about that. Um, I mean, it's it's about the way. I mean, I don't think it's also. I also don't think he's a villain. I mean, I think we're we're led to see really deep inside. Why does he feel the way he does? Why does he act the way he does? The poem presents him with compassion and also presents presents us with this awareness of how utterly disastrous his actions and his inactions are for other people. This is something that also fascinates me uh, uh, about the Iliad uh, is that who he is attacking the Trojans and, 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 and the state of Troy, city of Troy, I know this isn't a time of statehood, uh, <laughs> but the epic actually portrays the quote unquote enemies or people on the other side as being noble people, admirable Absolutely. people. Yes. I mean, I think you might expect a Greek poem about a war of Greeks against Easterners would present the, the enemy as bad guys. And the Iliad absolutely doesn't do that. I mean, it presents us with these two um, opposing armies of humans and then the third society in the poem, the, the Olympian gods, each of which is presented with deep compassion and understanding. And in certain ways, the greatest warrior of Troy, Hector, is as much the protagonist of the poem as Achilles is. And we see really deeply into why does he fight and what are his motives for that. And we also understand you know, his family life, his his relationship with his wife, his son, his parents, were, were led to really understand what's going on in Troy as well as what's going on in the Greek encampment and to empathize with all the characters, including the Trojans, certainly. In your introduction, you, you really talk a lot about Hector and his dynamic. And this is someone else who is seen, I, I think, as, as a noble, this sort of noble person. However, your introduction really made me kind of think about that a little bit more because his decision to go fight Achilles in which he knew he was going to die put everyone he loved at risk. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I think he is, I think both Achilles and Hector are presented as noble and godlike and also very dangerous because they're both living within this warrior society and Hector is a dutiful person who wants to avoid being shamed and he wants to fulfill his role as the best warrior in Troy. And doing that means that he has to keep pushing out ahead to confront the enemy, even if that means he may, may well increase his risk of dying and increase and therefore also increase the risk that the, the city he's defending will fall, that in defending the city, he's also risking the city. So I think that terrible paradox is really central in the poem's depiction of that central narrative of why does Hector fight? Why does he keep fighting not defensively, but as dangerously as possible? Because that's the way to get the most glory and to fulfill his you know, what he sees as his destiny and his close relationship with Zeus and the pressure that's put on him by his people is to remain glorious, even if that also means his parents and his wife are begging him to fight in a safer way so that he won't die as he does in right. the poem. And it's not just for his own sake. It's because not his just wife him. is it's going... Not, yes. his He's not risking just his own life because his whole city depends on him. And as in that heartbreaking sequence at the end of book six, where Andromache is begging him to fight from the wall rather than go out onto the plane, because if he dies, she knows that their baby will probably be thrown from the city walls, as was part of the myth, is that that baby will die, will be killed by the Greeks. She will be enslaved, his mother will be enslaved, his father will be killed, all of the people will be killed or enslaved. His city will fall because of him trying to save it in this way that focuses on his own glory. Honor, right? Honor, Honor is yes. the most yes. important. Theos, yes. Theos. And is, Theos. Is, this, yes. Is, this, is this common through Greek mythology? It's certainly central in the Iliad, and and it comes up again in you know in Greek tragedy as well. Just the dynamics of of Kleos as this dangerous kind of success, where people will risk anything for honor or prestige or reputation, 
And there's something wonderful about being willing to risk your life for glory. I mean, I think the Iliad certainly presents it in some ways as a very noble quest, and yet also as a quest that has a very high casualty rate. I mean, the, the number of deaths that occur in the Iliad through this terror of shame and desire for chaos. The Iliad takes place in the final year of, of a 10-year war, the, the Trojan War. Well, what Was there a Trojan War? There were probably many Trojan Wars. I mean, so there's a, there's a real historic city of Troy in what's now Turkey. Um, on the, in, in the Greeks call it the Hellespont, the, the Dardanelles. Um, it, it's a real historic site, and it was inhabited for many centuries. And we know archaeologically that it was repeatedly inhabited and then destroyed, both by natural disaster and presumably conflict. I mean, there were presumably several um, invasions or perhaps also civil wars in that site. So it was known to the Greek speaking world as a as a city and perhaps as a city where which had been fought over. Of course, the, the Iliad is not a sort of literal historical account of you know, any particular real life conflict. It's a mythologized version of a story about a great war. And, and again, you, this is Troy. Modern, so I, I always thought it was always controversial where, where Troy was. It, it's now pretty confirmed. It's pretty much confirmed. Yes, I mean, so we we know that it is what the Hittites called Willusa. That's been, that's been confirmed archaeologically. Um, and yes, it's it's. I mean, the controversy that was happening in the late 19th century when the German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann went and started esca excavating at what is um, at the site of Troy. I mean, he destroyed a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of things while trying to dig it up and prove that it really was Homer's Troy. I mean, some of the things he said were not not right. I mean, that he, he all of his dating was off. Um, and he and as I said, he destroyed a lot of evidence while trying to prove that the Iliad was historical fact. But it's yes, certainly the site of Troy is is in Turkey. It is that that place that Schliemann and and, and other archaeologists have been excavating. For, That's interesting. Yeah, Heinrich Schliemann's a story, a, a really complex story in of in of really himself. Really complex story. Yes. Um, yes. But yeah, that's, but he was correct in, in the site. Yes, so he wasn't the first person to say that, but yes, he, he was correct, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and again, um, the, these poem, the, the poem, the Iliad, the stories within it, and we'll, we'll talk about how we think we end up coming up with what we consider to be the Iliad. Uh, this comes, we, we think of ancient Greece, but this comes before when we commonly think of ancient Greece and, and Athens. Yes. Exactly. So Athens wasn't, uh, uh, people in antiquity were, in, in later antiquity, were quite surprised by how little, uh, how, how small a part the Athenians play in the, the, the story of the Iliad, because of course, Athens wasn't a big settlement. Um, it's a, it's it. The Iliad and the Odyssey are both based on centuries long oral traditions. And during that, that period of archaic Greece, Greece is really a misnomer because there were multiple different Greek speaking settlements all over the the world that's now Greece and and also the west coast of Turkey. There were Greek speaking settlements all over that area. Um, and, you know, it, within the Iliad, the the quote unquote Greeks really identify themselves with their local habitation, you know, the way that um, Achilles is from Thea. He's not from Greece as a whole. He doesn't necessarily identify as part of this whole um, sort of conglomerate of the Pan-Hellenic environment. But of but also the Iliad and the Odyssey were composed at a period when there was more and more sense of there should be collabor collaboration between the different Greek um, settlements. So part of the premise of the Iliad is sort of exploring what would it be like if there was if all the Greek sites got if all the Greek leaders got together and did something together. The Trojan War is a, a sort of mythological image of an idea of pan-Hellenism pan of Greece being a more coherent entity. Sounds like a, a world war. I mean, it think sounds of the like a world war, and it's presented in a way like a world you know? war. I mean, as yeah. a conflict between, you know, east and west in sort of monumental terms. And of course, by modern world war standards, it's a tiny bit of geography, but it's presented as huge. Yeah. How, how does the story come down through time? How, how do we get the Iliad? That's a big question because I know we're going through 
couple, maybe three thousand years here of history. But 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 how how yes. do, do we get the Iliad? So we get the uh, part of this taps into the Homeric question, which is the question of how did so I, I mentioned the long oral tradition, um, which involved oral poets without having any knowledge of reading and writing, composing um, ad lib stories based on formulaic um, phrasing and a traditional meter, dactylic hexameter, um, telling stories about the great mythical wars of Thebes and of Troy. Then at some point in the mid eighth century, Greece developed a writing system. And then probably fairly soon after that, the Homeric poems were composed using this new technology of writing. Um, so maybe in the early seventh century BCE, they were composed as these monumental written things based on the oral tradition, but using this new technology of writing. Of course, we don't have and, and exactly when that happened. It's controversial. Exactly how that happened is controversial. It, was it that an oral poet became literate? Was it dictated? How exactly did that happen? Um, without a time machine, I'm not sure quite how we would decide that. Um, and then those poems existed, I think, as written artifacts which circulated and but they were still for, for many centuries experienced primarily orally. So there were figures called rhapsodes who would learn the Homeric poems by heart and do show show like show for showing off um dramatic performances of a section of section of the Iliad as evening entertainment. Of course you can't do the whole thing as an after dinner thing or even as a festival thing, but do Here's, this, here's a scene from the Iliad as hmm. entertainment and as part of a religious or civic festival. Then um, in the second and third century BCE, um, the, there was the Library of Alexandria, where the, there were these scholars, Greek speaking scholars, who were gathered in this um, Egyptian city, Greek Egyptian city, who were, go, were sort of taking on the task of trying to put together um, authorized texts of the canonical works of Greek literature, of existing Greek literature. And so the texts that we have of the Iliad and the Odyssey are based on the work of those scholars in the Library of Alexandria. So we have papyri from that era, which are the earliest bits of the Homeric texts that we have. Most of the complete texts are, are based on medieval manuscripts, which were copies of copies of copies of those initial texts by the scholars of, of Alexandria. Are there different versions of the story? There are different, like, as with any ancient text, there's, there are textual variants. Um, so, for instance, in the beginning of the Iliad, um, some we know that some ancient versions said that the, the bodies of the, those killed in the war would become um, a feast for all the birds, or, 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 or would be eaten by all the birds, or else would be a feast for the birds. So it's a, it's a slight verbal variation. Is it oionoisi de, de tefasi or oionoisi te daita? Um, so that's a one word variation. There's quite a lot of those kinds of one word variation, or there's a quotation in Plato, which is slightly different from the received text that we have. We don't have a version of the Iliad that's totally different. We don't have a version that's here, here in this version, Hector didn't die, or in this version, Achilles didn't get mad at all. You know, that doesn't exist. And I don't think it would really be the Iliad if it's, it was that. We do, we do have evidence about other bits of the epic tradition, which we're telling other bits of the story. So, for instance, there's we have a summary and a quotation from a poem called the Cypria, which started with telling about the plan of Zeus to, to relieve Earth of the of the burden of too many people, um, and then it, it, it presumably told a different version of how did the how did the whole Trojan War come about. And there were presumably other epic poems about different elements of this of the mythic cycle, but yeah. we, we only have fragments and summaries of those. Yeah, that's interesting to me. Uh, recently, we had on religious scholar Bart Ehrman, and we talked about the history of the Bible, and it was sort of mind blowing mm -hmm. to me because you think of the Bible as a book, a single yeah. book, and he's like, "No, it's it's many books that some people Every decided books. to turn into a single book, uh, but yes. there were many books from before. Some got into the final Bible that we call the Bible, some didn't, and and I was yes. wondering if." if if, if that's sort of a common way that stories come to us and as, as a collection and if, if that at all rang true for, for the Iliad. Um, so some people argue that, um, so for instance, with the Iliad, book 10 is weird 
um, because it's the only book w- in which the fighting takes place at night rather than during the daylight hours. And it's, it features Odysseus and Diomedes sneaking into the Trojan camp and slaughtering Rhesus and stealing his horses. Um, and it has various verbal peculiarities. So some people argue maybe this is a later insertion into the poem. Maybe the poem existed in some form already. And then somebody thought we can add, we can add in this exciting night raid episode and just plug it in there. I mean, that's debatable though, because it also relies on a sort of a whole set of assumptions about how much was this poem sort of fully existing, um, as a complete thing before this other bit, other bit got started into it. Does it work like that? I mean, I think it's actually a little bit different from the Bible because in the case of, I mean, we, we know about how like Genesis is put together out of pre-existing written sources, sort of cut and paste, which is different from a poem that's put together out of an oral tradition, where the pieces of the oral tradition don't exactly sort of exist as, I'm going to cut out that bit and put it, put it in there. It's all part of the poet's memory. And you can compose through things you remember, but you're not exactly quoting if, if you're doing it in a way that's sort of pre-literate. This- so I'm not sure if it's quite the same thing. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Emily Wilson. Emily Wilson is a professor of classical studies at the University of Pennsylvania, and she joins us to talk about her new translation of the Iliad. Something else I find really fascinating is that within the Iliad, you you find hints of other stories that maybe we don't have anymore. Mm -hmm. But obviously people then knew of the stories because they reference the stories without telling you them. They just sort of reference them, them so everyone already knows what they are. Yes. Yes, I find that fascinating too. I mean, the Iliad, as I, I think we've already said in certain ways, is a very surprising um, take on the Trojan War story because it doesn't have the beginning of the war, it doesn't have the end of the war. Um, as we already said, it doesn't focus on Greeks versus Trojans, but Greeks versus Greeks. Um, but it has all these allusions to stories that aren't central or the, uh, that are in the background. So, for instance, we have these allusions to the first Trojan War when Heracles sacked Troy, which is a story that may be unfamiliar to many modern readers, but the audience is clearly assumed to know all about what happened when Heracles went to Troy. Um, I mean, a, a lot of these stories that are mo- the most famous stories for both in antiquity and in modern culture, like the Trojan horse, we know about those only from much later sources. Mm. Um, but they're clearly implied within Homer is that you're going to know about the Trojan horse. You're going to know about how did the Greeks sack the city, but we're not going to have. We're not going to bore you by telling you the famous bits. We're going to tell you the bits that are unexpected. <laughs> I'm going to quote your, your your translation once again, and this is another moment that I, I really remember, and it was vivid to me even as I read it. And this is when, after Achilles kills Hector, Achilles is brutal to Hector's body, doesn't allow for the traditional and expected funeral rites to happen, keeps the body, drags it wherever he goes, keeps the body with himself. Eventually, the king of Troy, Priam, uh, the father of Hector, comes to Achilles, asks for the body of Achilles, which Achilles gives it back to him. And, and their conversation is, to me, a very profound and, and touching conversation. And, 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 and Achilles says this to Priam, King Priam, quote, Now your son... Now your son has been released to you, just as you ask. He lies upon a bier, and when dawn shows her light, you will see him yourself and take him home. But now we need to turn our minds to dinner. Remember, even noble Niobe took thought of food, although she lost 12 children. It's a much longer quote, too long for me to read here. A couple things there were interesting to me. This, you know, again, this, 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 this just straight destruction that happens for so long and now it's time to stop and eat but also the mention of niobe i'm assuming people would have known who niobe was exactly yes people would have known who niobe was and that same speech also alludes to the the idea that there's a particular rock face on mount sipolis which 
um, has a waterfall running down it. And the, the local myth was that that's Ni Niobe turned to stone and she's weeping forever because she lost all her children. And so presumably there was also, it's also relying both on general mythic knowledge and perhaps also local topographical knowledge of, you may know Mount Sipolis by, you've heard, you've heard of the, the weeping rock. Um, and I mean, it's it's both a myth that you're supposed to know, and yet you also don't necessarily need to know it because Achilles tells the story, and he he tells explicitly to Priam. I mean, part of uh, so much of the of the talking and the teaching in the Iliad happens through stories, and through that story, he's saying both that grief does last forever because she's turned to stone; she's never going to stop crying, and yet she also has to eat. If you're going to be alive as a human, you have to eat, and you have to find some kind of connection with the people you live with. Even though, you know, terrible things happen, the people you love may all be killed. Turn to stone. I mean, it almost sounds metaphoric. That, that's Certainly, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think also because, I mean, there's, there's this sort of repeated trope of um, what is it to be a human being as opposed to being made of a hard object? I mean, Paris says that to Hector, that he's like an axe. And it, within the conversation of Hector and Achilles before Achilles kills Hector, there's also that trope of, is your heart made of iron? And Priam is also told your heart must be made of iron that you could dare to come through the enemy camp. So in a way, the heroes in this poem have to have iron hearts or stone faces, and yet they also have to be able to weep and be able to eat. You mentioned Paris. <laughs> Obviously, this is an important <laughs> figure. Um, yes. The war is, I mean, you could say, is it because of the, the beauty contest between the goddesses? When, when does the war really begin? Uh, but you could put a starting point of the war of when... Uh, Helen, uh, the wife of Menelaus, uh, mm -hmm. is falls. Well, my assumption was always fell in love with Paris. They fell in love with each other, and that she willingly uh, mm -hmm. uh, left Sparta. I think Helen of Sparta. She yep. left Sparta yep. and went to Troy with um, with Paris. However, in reading your introduction, I, I got the sense that she might have been kidnapped. I mean, I think the Iliad itself gives you that sense of ambiguity about it because in book three of the Iliad, we have what in a way is a replay of the story that the poem doesn't give us of that initial, how did, how did Helen get, how did Helen go off with Paris? And in that sequence, um, there's a duel between Paris and Menelaus. Aphrodite loves Paris, scoops him off the battlefield, saves him. Um, and plonks him down in the bedroom and then tells Helen she has to go to bed with him. And Helen very clearly says, I don't want to go. It's embarrassing. He's an embarrassment. I don't want to go with him. He's, you know, he, he's obviously attractive, but that's, it, it doesn't look good. And it's not, not what I want to be doing. And the goddess dominates her and, and le leads her to bed with him. So we're presented with a Helen who, I mean, you could read that scene and think maybe Aphrodite is an allegor allegorical representation of lust. Maybe she's overwhelmed by my desire. Or you could read it and think this shows that this human being doesn't have a choice. She's forced into something that she doesn't want to do. And she's t she tells us, she tells Aphrodite very explicitly that, you know, like, like the male warriors, she cares about honor and reputation. And it doesn't, it's not a good way to increase your honor and reputation to be in bed with Paris. And is that something you got by by going back to the Greek original text? Yes, I mean, I think the I think the Iliad certainly goes out of its way to present Helen as this complicated character. Like we're not told in the poem that it's sort of unambiguously clear that Helen decided to go. I mean, we're we're never told that by even by any other characters, let alone by the narrator. Um, we're told repeatedly that Helen seems to regret being there, and also we're told in that scene that I just talked about that she doesn't want to go to bed with him. Am I again? I, I had the sort of Romeo and Juliet essence <laughs> of of them. Um, what am I? What, what, was was I alone in that, or is this is this idea that she was kidnapped uh, sort of commonly accepted? I mean, I th I'm not sure that it's an ambiguity, um, there's ambiguity about whether it's kidnapped or is it, I mean, I, I also said, you know, it depends partly how we read the goddess, right? How, how do we understand the actions of the gods in the poem? If we really think we're, we're supposed to believe in them as real forces, then she's kidnapped by the goddess as much as by Paris. Um, I mean, I think it's also the case that, you know, some mo modern depictions of the Helen and Paris story um, reduce the ambiguities that are there in in the Iliad's depiction of it. Um, 
I mean, in the Iliad, there's also, I think, another thing to bear in mind is that what's at stake in the, in the, when they, when, the, when the Greeks and Trojans are discussing having a duel to see if they can resolve the war without more casualties, they repeatedly say, if Menelaus wins, then Paris has to give back Helen and all the property, Helen and all the property. And that phrase re recurs. So it, if we sort of see that the, that in that phrasing, Helen is being treated as part of the pro property, the property doesn't choose to go. It, Paris in that way is a thief rather than a, I mean, he's as much a thief as an adulterer. Um, so I don't know. I mean, obviously, in, within later texts in antiquity, there were a whole range of different ways to depict Helen. There was also an ancient myth that said she never went to Troy at all. It was a um, the, the gods made a, a ghost that looked like Helen, who was the one over whom the whole war was fought, which is, of course, a myth that allows for exploration of, you know, is war always fought for nothing? Is it always fought for an image or a word? Um, in, in that myth, which Euripides wrote a really great play about called the Helen, she spends the whole war in Egypt. Yeah. In preparing for our conversation, I was like, Where, "Where's that line? How, how did how did uh, how did Emily, Emily Wilson translate the line, uh, the face that launched a thousand ships?" And as <laughs> yes. I was looking for that, I realized, <laughs> "Oh, it's not in yes. there at all." It's it was Christopher <laughs> Marlowe. Yes, yes, exactly. And of course, that's um, you know, she, within that play, she's a representation of. Um, sexual desire as a Christ as an anti-Christian temptation, which is of course not what the Iliad is doing with that character. It's a very, it's a very you know in a way it's an anachronistic um, thing to put back onto hmm. the Iliad. Yeah, and Christopher Marlowe is contemporary of Shakespeare, so hmm. um, obviously much later. <laughs> yes. uh, I, if I can come back to Achilles and, and some of the words that you choose to use, I, I found one that was interesting that you use continually and I, I think purposefully deliberately and that was wrath mm -hmm. achilles wrath tell me about the mm -hmm. importance of the word wrath for you yes so the first word of the poem in the original is menin from menis um the poem has several different there are several different greek terms for anger or rage um the normal word for human anger is cholos which is related to the word we get melancholy from which is black mm -hmm black rage. Um, so cholos is the normal way that humans get angry with each other. Uh, the, the choice of menace marks Achilles' wrath as something different because that word is used usually used for the wrath of gods, which is why I choose wrath because I think it has a biblical connotation which sounds more like divine anger than human anger. Um, and so that, and, and that word comes up repeatedly in relation to the wrath of Achilles and there are several cognates which I also translate consistently with wrath and wrathful. I think the difference between Achilles' rage and the, those of normal, normal mortals is that Achilles has this, Achilles' rage has the capacity to cause vastly more harm. I mean, if a, if a man is angry, I mean, we see, we, we see a lot of angry men in the Iliad causing a lot of damage. And if men are angry with each other in a normal way, they may kill several other men, but they don't cause the deaths of thousands of other people not by, by not doing anything which is what it happens with the wrath of Achilles, that he, even though he's he's absent from the battlefield, and yet because of his wrath, so many people die. So in a way, it's like the, the wrath, of, of, wrath of Apollo, which we also see at the start of the Iliad, where Apollo is enraged at the, at the abduction of the, the priest's daughter, Chryseis, and as a result of that, he shoots the arrows of plague through the Greek camp, and so many people can die because through plague because Apollo is the sun god and the plague god. And in a way, Achilles' wrath is like that. It's something spreading almost like a divine or natural phenomenon. For, for you, do, do you see the Iliad to be about anything? I mean, obviously it's about a Trojan War, but a, about some particular theme. Do, do, do you think it's about conflict? Do you think it's about grief? I, I suspect it, it's about a lot of things. How I think you... it's about a lot of things, yes. I mean, I think it's about the intertwining of rage and grief and how closely those, th those emotions go together and the momentous consequences of those emotions specifically, that we constantly see how being deprived of something or someone, either Achilles being deprived of honor in the first quarrel or being deprived of Patroclus in the second sequence of his wrath, or Hector fearing the loss of honor, that these fears of loss or the experience of loss provokes grief, which then provokes rage because 
men who experience loss want to get it back or at least get revenge if they can't. So that cycle of rage, which then is going to cause more grief, which is going to cause more rage. And then I think also that the, the central theme of human mortality, and partly because the gods, the immortals are so central in the poem, you get so much of a clear sense of how similar gods are to mortals in so many ways, except for the fact that they don't die. And the Iliad teaches us over and over again that this fundamental element of humanity is that the spear can pierce you anywhere and you'll die. You have this great line in your introduction, Hector believes, believe, let me say it again, Hector believed he had the protection of deities, which is never a safe assumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so, I mean, Hector thinks he has Zeus on his side, which is only partly true because Zeus has agreed that while Achilles is sitting out of the battle, Hector will triumph. But of course, that's not a forever thing. It's not that Zeus is going to save Hector. Of course, he's not. And even Achilles, who who has his sea goddess mother on his side, she wants to restore his lost honor. But in doing that, she you know, enables the death of Patroclus and shortens his life. I mean, I just think there's some wisdom there. Every, everyone always Absolutely. thinks they have God on their side or a God everyone or whatever it may be. Everyone thinks that they could get lucky or there's something special about them. And maybe there is something special about all of us, and yet we're still going to die. And the gods might not be as much on our side as we think. I mean, even Aphrodite is so close to Helen, but that doesn't mean she's going to do what she wants. What, what do you think the Iliad says about the ancient world? Oh, that's such a, such a big question. I'm not sure where to start with that. Um, I mean, I think it presents this uh, this world which is both so different and so familiar. I mean, if, if it's a question about just how different is the ancient world from the modern world, I mean, in some ways it's very, very different, right? I mean, there's animal sacrifice. There's all these different ways that you know, even just imagining what is a body, it's a collection of knotted limbs together while we're alive and then the limbs unravel. There's something quite alien about a lot of the way the story is told. Um, and of course, you know, most of us don't believe in the Olympian gods anymore, and it's quite different. Um, and yet at the same time, the emotions and the interactions of characters are, are very, you know, it's, it's very possible to get oneself to empathize with them and understand how they feel and how they interact with each other. So I think it shows you both how distant the ancient world is and also how comprehensible it can be. Yeah, I mean, I think this dynamic that you talked about, about rage and grief, is is pretty profound. I think so too, yes. And, that, and that's a clear theme. Absolutely, yes. A purposeful yes. theme yes. through, through yes. the Iliad. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Iliad's also full of, of insults, isn't it? It is, yes. It is, it is. I mean, she's, I, mean I, I laugh because I think some of them are, some of the most enjoyable elements of the poem are the inventiveness of the insults. And in that great quarrel sequence in, the, in book one of Achilles and Agamemnon slinging insults at each other. I mean, it's both horrifying and intense, but also almost black comedy. Um, and, and also, I mean, I think there's something fascinating about how the Iliad both feels very, very real. I mean, in, in its depictions of what, is it, what does it feel like to be on the battlefield, either as a killer or the killed, or in its depictions of grief and family dynamics. But it's also, it's so stylized because in, in most battles, presumably also in antiquity, pe people are constantly pausing on the battlefield. Everyone's wearing full armor. And yet before you throw the spears, we're going to have a long speech with insults. <laughs> and <laughs> or, or there's going to be a long speech of, you, you guys have to go into battle and let me give you a long speech telling you why. I mean, I think on some level, that's also totally unrealistic. And yet it also speaks to the way that, you know, action is built out of emotions and out of language. And, you know, we, we live in a, in a world where we're very aware of how you know, people are dominated by or shaped by media. And in the Iliad, people are shaped by rhetoric and form each other's actions and define, it, find, define their own actions by rhetoric. And they're always very, Achilles and Hector are both extremely aware that their lives are going to be short, but what they'll have afterwards, if they're lucky, is going to be both a funeral and a memorial mound and a story. A place in this story, in this poem, I, 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 and I suspect the the insults and, and the comedy also give us insight into the people of the ancient. Absolutely, world. Yeah. yes, and the and the insults also speak to the kinds of pressure that these um, 
people in a warrior society are putting on each other that very often the insults have to do with either like or, or the 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 urgings to fight very often have to do with a leader saying be men and then the insults very often have to do with you're not being sufficiently manly you're being you're like a gymnast you're like an acrobat you're not like a proper warrior there's something um there's some way that you're not f fulfilling your proper role and you should be humiliated by that set of set of tropes the iliad in greek is very rhythmic mm -hmm. you you wanted to your, you wanted your translation to have its own sort of rhythm absolutely yes so my my primary goal in doing these homeric translations was feeling frustrated that so many tr modern translations of homer Aren't, don't use meter in English, whereas the originals used dactylic hexameter. They were usually experienced out loud in antiquity, performed and made dramatic and also musical. They may have been strumming along to the lyre while performing these poems. So they, ha they have this beat. You can sort of tap your feet to the beat. Um, so I used a very regular iambic pentameter to try to evoke that experience for the anglophone reader of, of, of a rhythm that sort of cues you into this is traditional in this language, just as dactylic hexameter was the traditional way of telling poetic metrical narrative in archaic Greece. I think a lot of translations that we have gotten over time in, in, in you know, the last 100, 200 years, I don't know, you know, recently, let's say in recent history, um, they're, they're really formal. Mm -hmm. Whereas my understanding of the the original Greek is, is actually not formal at all. It's very sort of straightforward talk, speech. I'm, I'm not I sure about that? that. I mean, I think, I think it's formal and I mean, it's metrical and it has... It has a it has a register that isn't quite like real speech. Um, it has an art of artifice and a and a sense of po of poetic artifice to it. Um, so I'm, it's not not necessarily chatty, but it has a very very great clarity and rapidity and directness. And the syntax is designed to be easily comprehensible out loud. So it's not sort of it's not difficult syntactically. It's not, it's not full of sort of long um, subordinate clauses. Um, it's not like Paradise Lost, where you sort of have this these subordinate clause within subordinate clause within subordinate clause. Um, in Homo, it's very much um, coordinated syntax, where you're, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and it's it's all being told within a metrical poetic register and with some diction that probably wasn't ever part of real conversational chatty speech there are ways that you know, I'm, I'm sure that in real life people didn't say his limbs are knotted and his spirit you know the, the bronze jangled around him as he fell I mean, there are ways that the diction i mean i'm sure people on the sp street weren't talking about cataclysmic wrath or ulomanaire menace so there are ways that it's poetic and marked as poetic um but it's also not unclear you know and it's very direct and um you know, there's there's a way that it's not designed to be obscure. There's also these long lists through through long the lists, Iliad yes. that that could be laborious to read. Um, but but these were what meant to be songs. Well, not it's not exactly a song, but the distinction between poetry and song. You know, maybe there isn't as sharp a distinction as we might think between a poem and a song. Um, I think the lists make much more sense if you remember that they're designed for oral performance and they're, de they're designed to be a sonic experience as much as an experience of of memory and of virtuosic storytelling technique. Um, and it's, it's also a way of evoking the whole world. I mean, the catalogue of ships sort of traces the way, shows, showcases the way this is like a world war because it's showing us a sort of verbal map of the whole Greek speaking world. And finally, are, are obviously the Odysseus, the Iliad, and the Odyssey are closely related. Are are they of the same story? Do you think they are the same? Uh, are, are they are they connected? Are they different stories? How how would you describe the relationship to, of them? I think they're very closely connected. I mean, I think the chances are that the Iliad. I mean, whether or not we think it's a single composer who made made both of them, I think the Iliad. I think they, they seem to answer each other. I think the Odyssey was probably composed with with close knowledge of the Iliad. I mean, the fact that the Odyssey doesn't replicate the Iliad, but then they also tell these parallel stories, the stories of um, of war and of homecoming and of um, of, of the, the 
the, the ways that the Trojan War impacts both Troy and then in the Odyssey, the whole of the rest of the world. Um, I think they, they, they also both have this sort of parallel structure in terms of both focusing on a single elite warrior who gets separated from his community. So, of course, in the Odyssey, that's Odysseus, who's separated from his community and has to be reintegrated into the community of Ithaca. And that, that problem of how can the separated warrior get back? And that that's, that's the story of the Odyssey, is how does he get back? In the Odyssey, it's through this sort of dynamic of homecoming, disguise, recognition, hospitality. In the Iliad, Achilles is separated from his Greek-speaking community throughout the first three th the first section of the poem and then he's separated from in a way from all of humanity in the final sequence of the poem until that meeting of Priam and Achilles so it's this story of how does the alone isolated warrior come back and that same story happens with Hector even though he comes back only once he's dead Emily Wilson has been our guest. Again, Emily Wilson is a professor of classical studies at the University of Pennsylvania, and she has joined us for a conversation about her new translation of the Iliad. Emily Wilson, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.